Our next guest, who is uh, Wutautas Michalewiczu, and I apologize if I'm not pronouncing it right. Um, he's a Lithuanian uh, curator, researcher, and associate professor whose focus has gradually shifted from photography in the expanded field to media, art, and theory, and lately also into artistic research in academic and beyond. He teaches art practice and theory, and he's a head of photography and media art department, as well as the doctoral program in fine arts at Vilnius Academy of Art. He received his PhD in critical media studies in Vilnius University in 2010, and he has served as artistic director of Nida Art Colony uh, from 2010 to uh, 19. He has also curated uh, exhibitions, among that uh, the Lithuanian Pavilion at the 56th Venice Biennale. He has published uh, several publications on artistic research, but I think he will tell us a bit more about that. Uh, uh, we had the privilege, some of us, to be in a workshop with him yesterday uh, on mapping and diagramming in artistic research. And uh, that was, I think we will talk a bit about that uh, later on. Um, but please, please welcome without us. Yeah, I'm happy to be invited here by Christina and Christopher, and I'm happy that I'm coming not from the west, but from the east of Copenhagen. So it's, Vilnius is just over the lake, I mean the Baltic Sea, on the other side of uh, this uh, sea, which is kind of almost the lake. And um, uh, this is my, where is my title? Oh, my title is here. So the title sounds a little bit... Um, uh, problematic, and I also want to disclose with you several issues and problems, and I'm sorry that I have so much material here that you won't experience everything, but it will be, I think, a little bit challenging and provocative and has a lot of uh, uh, more questions than answers, but I'm very happy that you will continue and get into dialogue with me and uh, uh, somehow help to at least try to answer some questions. Yes, so let's move on. Uh, I'm trying, yeah, it works. So this is the alternative title of my talk. Uh, where is artistic research in the academy? Underground, uberground, or at the rector's office? Unfortunately, the rector is not today with us, so he cannot answer. But it's, it's, I think, a really interesting uh, like thought exercise when you try to think. Is it like artistic research somewhere outside the academy in the uh, hidden art circles or research circles? Or is, or, is it, or is it somehow floating in the air as a, as a, as, as a future project? That's why it's uberground, somewhere, somewhere what you want to reach, but you, you are not possible, you cannot reach it. Or maybe it's, it's ordered from administration and the uh, rector says that now everybody who wants to teach in the Academy of Arts uh, has to have a doctoral degree. And unfortunately, this was the case in Romania. I was visiting a couple of weeks ago Bucharest Biennale, where I was giving a talk. And uh, in the year 2000, uh, there was a law coming from the Ministry of Education that Every artist teaching at the academy, having a professorship, has to have a doctoral degree. So we gave six years, like interim period, and everybody had to, everybody from 30 to 70 years professors, we had to get a PhD, otherwise we were fired. And this happened in 2006, there was no any professor without doctoral degree. And by this um, precedent, uh, artistic research became a kind of very hated discipline and phenomena because it kicked out a lot of good artists out of the academy. So I hope this won't happen uh, in Denmark uh, and in other countries all around the world. Yeah, so let's start our first encounter with a, a small comics, two comics actually made by Swedish, American, German artist Olof Westfalen. And as you see on the left side, he says that artistic research is kind of a Eurocentric colonialistic project and, and it's better to go to the beach. 
uh, instead of doing it oh, and uh, get yourself into some things which are much more interesting. Or on the other side, on the right side, you have a typical conversation with a supervisor and the supervisor thinks that your thesis, she's recommending a much smaller font. And the student is happy, but then she reveals that nobody will read it, so that's why you have to choose it. Yeah, so there is a lot of strange uh, uh, encounters with artistic research, and uh, I have been interested in this topic for 14 years from now. In, firstly, I was myself artist and curator and finally researcher, and I'm involved in this kind of new subject which is called artistic research studies. So it means I'm studying artistic research as a, as a phenomena. I don't want to say a discipline because it's not a discipline and maybe it's not becoming a discipline. I hope so. It's something else. So in my structure of the talk is, uh, I have five parts, and one is that uh, I want to speak a little bit about the epistemological trajectories of this, so to say, paradiscipline, like, you know, parapsychology or paraphysics. So it's something which is uh, not very uh, confirmed. It's not, very, it's not producing truth, not producing maybe uh, knowledge which is, is, which is recognized all around uh, other research disciplines. Second part, I will shortly speak about my two publications which are here and we will, I will circulate them around. If I forget, please let me know because I know sometimes it's very boring to follow talking head and watch it at the slides so you can deep, uh, get into the book and I don't mind. It's better to get into the book than to your email account or Facebook account during the talk. <clears throat> and um, the third is, um, I will very briefly show a few artistic research projects from Lithuania which are outside academia, but they are still very good examples of artistic research and they are recognized in the international art world. If we have time, I say a few words about our program. And uh, for the five, for number fifth, I, I think we don't have time, but I'll just make advertisement. You can read it later somewhere. We are now publishing an article with my colleague because we are doing a, a collective research project. I really like this collective exercise <laughs> of hand washing. Yeah, so we are doing collective research project with one philosopher in Lithuania about the impact of artistic research on humanities and uh, visual arts. So this is one of our findings, trying to apply ornithology to better understand what is artistic research. <clears throat> yeah, so let's move forward. Yeah, so what is this, what is our epistemic community? We are now in here. As Christopher has already announced, we are in the International Center for Knowledge in the Arts. But if we read the uh, website, we are in uh, another type of a center which has a completely different uh, name in, in, in Danish language. So now I'm feeling a little bit confused which one is right. And uh, the English name is international, but the Danish name is not international. What's, what happens? I'm, I'm mixed up. I, I feel somehow anxious. I'm not sure in which epistemic community I'm now. Because uh, if I, when I use Google Translator, it translates me like this, this name. Center for Artistic Knowledge and Development. So it's a completely different thing. Completely different thing from the English, official English name. What is development? Who is being developed? Is it artist? Is it research? Is it art? Is it uh, your friend? Is it something else? Is it art market? Or is it art academy? Is it art education? So a lot of questions. <clears throat> and also, yeah, the most important thing is uh, yeah, what is artistic knowledge and what is, what is development. But let's move further. So we have, uh, I want to a little bit speak uh, about my title. And title, maybe you have already remember, it was a special concept, epistemic community. There are a lot of definitions of it, but just very, two very simple ones. You don't need to read everything, but just I want to, share, to tell you that community, of course, is a group of people with shared knowledge, expertise, or beliefs, or ways of looking at the world. For example, the scientific community. So I'm sure that all of us represent different scientific communities. Some of us, sorry, different epistemic communities. Some of them are artists, musicians, somebody is art historians, maybe philosophers, maybe dancers, maybe, maybe there's somebody else. So, yeah, it's, it's a fusion of different communities and, and uh, it's, it's not easy to find out. Also, there's another nice word, uh, concept presented by Fish, interpreted, interpretive community. So it's, it's a way how we interpret something. 
which I think is also useful for our future investigations, what is artistic research. But basically, it's also, I want to ask the question, who takes care of artistic research? Because taking care and curating is also very important. It comes from the health issues and social relationship issues, but also it's very important because uh, who takes care, who takes the role of a curator, uh, this person or this system somehow puts already some, uh, I don't know, stereotypes on, on, on the way you work. And um, if some epistemic community is taking care, so the question is which one? And uh, then I say art, just it's a f small footnote, I want to include all the disciplines, despite the fact that I am from, let's say, visual arts and media arts myself, but I have my PhD in critical media studies, which is humanities slash social sciences. But when I say art, please have in mind that I also mean everything else, which is what is listed here, uh, including design, architecture, film, music, performing arts, lit literature, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so who takes care of artistic research? Is it art practice? Is it artist? Or is it research discipline? Is it uh, art history? Is it mus musicology? Is it theater of film studies? Uh, we are not yet sure. Or maybe it's philosophy of science and philosophy of art and technology. Or maybe it's STS, science and technology studies. So there are, I mean, depending which, who takes care of uh, artistic research, Based on that, we have a definition. So I'm still having a lot of questions. What is epistemic community of artistic research? Is it uh, made of artists and performers? Is it made of art historians or philosophers? Is it uh, art critics? Is it curators maybe? Or maybe art market and performing arts agents who is taking care? Or maybe academics? Everybody is crying that artistic research will ac academize the artistic practice again. Because in the 18th century, when academies of fine arts were est established, they didn't academize art at all. But now, uh, artistic research is going to academize and make uh, artist art practice academic. So for me, sometimes this uh, blame blames sounds ridiculous. We'll see. We need some more years to go. Or maybe audience is a epistemic community of artistic research. And that's why I came up with this idea that maybe artistic research is a, that trans-epistemic community takes care of artistic research. And what is this trans-epistemic community? And um, I think that artistic research also comes out of uh, clashes and fights and rivalry between various epistemic communities, and uh, uh, I think that trans-epistemic community is non-binary, neither art nor science research, and it's transcending and transversing the traditional epistemic communities. And trans in this means that we have a fusion of not only artistic and scientific communities, but also everyday practice communities, like we have an example before shamanism, yoga classes or religious practice or just a simple walking, like you walk and you walk and talk. So this is also a practice, which is very much practice. You know that uh, family doctors, they always advise that you should uh, walk at least 10,000 steps a day. Otherwise, you are not a human be being because you are not using your muscles and your legs and hands in a way you want to use, uh, you, in a way you want to be a proper animal, human being. For other types of uh, other species of animals, you, there are different recommendations. But for human beings, you need to walk at least 10,000 steps to be a, uh, a good representative of a species. And of course, to stay fit. Yes, so this is my proposal. But of course, we, uh, if we try to say artistic research to the native speaker, of English language, so everybody has a headache because it sounds very strangely. And there's a problem with this artistic, adjective artistic in English language. I'm not sure how about the Danish language, but also we have the same trouble in Lithuanian language and um, maybe also in some other languages as well. And uh, I'm always asking if the artistic means the type of research or the way it looks. 
Maybe research looks beautiful and nice, and then that's why it's artistic research. So does it refer to this artistic, does it refer to the context, subject, or object? Or maybe arty research is a better term if we think that artistic uh, somehow conno uh, brings connotation of nice and uh, artful activity. Yes, what, what? So there's also, as I said, paradox of artistic research. And um, you see that, for example, what is artistic painting? Do you have an answer? What is artistic painting? And what is artistic sculpture? Is, it, is painting always artistic? Or is sculpture always artistic? Yeah, so this is a question, what is artistic art? So I think it's a very complicated term. Uh, it was very complicated 10 years ago and 15 years ago, and still it is now, but we somehow got used to it, and we don't find a better term. For example, yeah, in German you have this Künstlich, which means also artificial, maybe it's not real, or maybe it's like not real or serious research. Yeah, practice-based research is another type of um, research where the main methodology is artistic practice. Yeah, so in five years, 60 years ago, I started to do a postdoc on artistic research. So I was researching artistic research or investigating it as, as, as a field, as a phenomenon. And I published a book, and this book was full of uh, diagrams and, and pictures and they were produced with collaboration of various artists and designers. So I'll share some of them with you, and um, by the moment, during the moment I'm sharing, you can watch this book. So this is a small copy. The original was in Lithuanian language, and it was a really huge one, like, like this one, but only blue, uh, blue color. And uh, with one artist, we were doing one exercise, trying to find a better uh, adjective for the word for the for the for replacement of artistic. Uh, so this is this is a Lithuanian language, so you can try to read it. But uh, the word tirimas means research, and uh, the upper part is adjective, which we were trying to replace each of the time. And so I I was a copywriter. I wrote the different adjectives, and the artist tried to find the uh, Font, font or callig calligraphy, because the artist was studying uh, printmaking. So she was trying to express the, the, the kind of connotation and emotion. So the first one is artistic research, manliness. And the second one is uh, fine artistic research, because you know we are an academy of fine arts, yeah? What is fine art? It's refined, elegant, nice. So maybe artistic research should be like this. This is a translation. The Linus Tirumas. And uh, then we went further on. So the third version was RT research, which is, you see already, you see the change of, of the font and type, typeface. And this is the RT research. And then on the right side, you have a, another type of adjective. And it's groziness Tirumas, where groziness means like a, something beautiful. And the groziness comes from the Lithuanian word for fiction literature. So if you say uh, like literature, fiction, fiction literature, like novel or poem, so you use this word groziness as an adjective to, 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 the, to, to refer to it. So if you translate directly into English, it will be fictional research. And the final one was the lucis tirimas. You can already feel the difference. And uh, it's, if you translate it, it should be refined or elegant research. And it's directly refers to the figure skating in the Fian language. The Ilusis Chojimas is a way, uh, it's a sport activity where you skate. So you see, it's quite difficult uh, to have these different uh, adjectives and, and try to find a, a right uh, definition of research used in the arts. Yes, time is running. Let's move further. Yeah, why are we doing artistic research? Yeah, because of a fam world famous, maybe you know, anthropologist, Arjun Abadurai, 
in 2006, he wrote a very nice essay, The Right to Research, and he said that all citizens of any democratic societies have right to research, including artists as well. But he was also talking about the working class people and also about various communities, but I mean, this text is quite seminal and, and uh, I'm also trying to use it uh, and adapt it to the artistic uh, practices as well. Also, Bologna pra uh, uh, somehow forces us to do research, but also they said that if all the sciences and subjects have right to study in all three cycles, I mean, so art should also have this right on its own. I mean, so by Bologna process, all the European schools have to offer studies in all the three cycles, bachelor, master, and, and PhD or doctor of arts. So this is like a very basic right for any subject, any discipline. And we have to fight for this right. And also t uh, Bologna says, uh, and all Bologna documents that teaching has to be based on research. <clears throat> and we have to explode sometimes the boundaries of academic disciplines, skills, gangs, and cliques. Yeah, probably you know this types of, types of different relationship between research and art. I just very briefly uh, remind you that uh, research on art is mostly done by art historians. And research for art is done nearly by every artist because you do preparations to produce your artwork, you research into materials, into the context, art history, philosophy, whatever. So you prepare to make an art uh, object or process or whatever. And then research for through art or in art is done mostly by artist researchers. This means that you do research while you do your artistic practice and you create new insights on new knowledge or whatever. Now this is one of the diagram from my books and uh, yeah, there are two different interpretations. How, how do you do research? So for uh, yeah, I'm sorry because it's not very good reproduction, but on the right side you can see three cups of tea or coffee. So the, the, the highest one has a, like a research through art. You go directly through something and you change both your practice and, and, and you generate some new knowledge in it. Let's move forward. Time is running. Uh, so another important thing is when research is happening. So we have, there are several answers and this is just the beginning of the list. So I already told you when you produce and generate new knowledge, insights, understandings in the certain field. And uh, another is when you test the limits of your field or epistem or, and communicate it. Of course, you have to define your field and discipline. Maybe you are on the borders of some other discipline or in your own discipline. And I also think that research becomes artistic research when you base it on your artistic practice or your methods are coming from it. It's a short reminder. So now I'm half through my talk. I hope you can still follow me, and uh, uh, I promise I have much more pictures in the end, so sorry for so much text in the beginning. So okay, another question is, what makes an artistic research a good doctoral thesis? I think, first of all, it has to be re research in general and comply to, s to any regulations, guidelines, protocols of certain research paradigm. You can have it very different from from usual research paradigm. And secondly, it should be it should challenge the epistem and based on peer agreement of the epistemic community. So if other artists and researchers agree that your piece of production or process is artistic research, then everything is fine. You can do whatever you want. So it's always a consensus is agreement of several uh, people or like a group or epistemic community. And I always like, like uh, when you challenge these uh, limits, like we have seen in Yana's presentation before, that her thesis was uh, uh, like, if you look at it from a traditional perspective, very small, like a very thin book, 
and everything else was artistic practice and the exhibition and the catalog and a book and but everything of course made the one thing which you can call a thesis and also yeah contribution to the field of epistem and also uh, yeah to to make this chapter to finish this chapter i want to say that artistic research is it made by artists only? Probably not. And uh, I have found a lot of different examples. And you can say yes if you feel like you are an artist who wants to do research, but you can also say no if you are not an artist. And you can find another examples why, why, why you can do artistic research and be another type of, let's say, creative uh, investigator. So there are much more people who are doing also artistic research. So there are some scholars and scientists and academics and curators and producers and writers. Everybody who can do research by practice and employ artistic, let's say, methods, they can be recognized as artistic researchers. I hope so, and yeah, I've seen some quite good examples. Yes, yeah, so always you have a crisis of identity. I'm a scientist and I'm a researcher. I'm an artist and I'm a curator. Who am I? So sometimes artistic researcher or artist researcher solves this question. Yes. Yeah, there is also different names for it. Arts-informed research, arts-based research, curatorial research, and they, um, there are Let's not go deeper into it, because time is running and we have to have some more fun things here. Yeah, also, it's what is important where artistic research is happening. It's happening not only in the arts, as I said, but also in humanities and social sciences and STEM. Uh, sciences, technologies, engineering and mathematics, STEM is an abbreviation for it, and natural sciences. And also not only in the global north, but also in the global south, as well as in the global east where I'm coming from, and uh, yes, so let's come to this book, and uh, very briefly, just I want to share very, very small findings from it, so this is the original version, which was three times bigger, but since it was written in a very small unknown language, I had to translate it into an English one, so uh, and I had to compress it to make the travels, uh, to, to make the shipment much cheaper because, you know, because of CO2, this book, book, this big book is difficult to transport. <clears throat> and you see this diagram looks much nicer on the book, in the book, and it's difficult to, 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 to present it on, on, on the screen. So actually, this is also an account how did they fail doing research at the university, like a, in a traditional university, and why I stopped being an artist. Uh, but what I like is that writing of this monograph is a hybrid practice, and it's based along with research on a certain curatorial logic that governs the selection and juxtaposition of debaters, topics, and ideas. In addition, it combines the methods of humanities, social sciences with art practice via collaboration with artists and designers. So basically this book is, a, is a, like a very, let's say, it involves a lot of epistemic communities and various methods. And from the first glance, it looks like it's a usual research book. But when I was doing the process, it was really uh, collaborative and trying out different research methods. Yes, um, there are some more pictures. For example, here uh, we tried with an artist, Anastasia Sosunova, somehow to find the way to define what is research in Lithuanian language, and there are seven different definitions for it. So each of a small diagram represents one of the definitions. <clears throat> yes, so let's move forward. Um, yeah, in that, so the, in the, as a conclusion, I had a three and a half questions about artistic research and 
they are still being solved. I haven't solved them so far. So one is, what has the research turn in the art changed? And the second one is, is the artistic research a new type of applied art? Angewandte Kunst? How is it in Danish? Yeah, maybe. Yes, so my question was if it's new type of applied art because you can apply your artistic practice to generate knowledge, get some funding, get money, become a professor, etc., etc. And also, another thing is maybe it's a, it's a very short-lived trend or maybe it's a genre or kind of art or maybe specific art, you never know. And uh, number four is very much enjoyed by the artists because a lot of artists think that PhD in art, if it has funding, it's a long-term residency program. You get fun, you get studio, you get access to laboratories and techniques and materials, you get access to discourse, discourses, professors, uh, community, and that's not so bad. It's quite enjoyable if the funding is great. Yeah, but maybe it's a value creation mechanism which somehow tracks to, tries to extract knowledge from, from everything what is moving and has some fights, uh, sorry, ideas inside it. So it's a lot of strange questions and uh, it's not easy to answer them. <clears throat> yeah, so if you try to, I mean, I was reading some labels in the exhibitions last 10 years, for example. If you try to read, go to the exhibition, you see that nobody is making art anymore. If you read the artist statement, you see that the artist is researching problems, context, discourses, situations, oneself, etc., etc. The language has changed a lot. How do you communicate about your artistic practice? Also, Yeah, you have this application, as, as I said. You, you can, if you have a doctoral degree in arts, you are allowed to teach in some academies, or sometimes if you apply for professorship, it has so many, so many uh, applications that only artists with doctoral degree gets the position, etc., etc. Yeah, so to make the long story short, this book was conceived as a curatorial process with changing roles in undressing rooms, both in artists, humanities, and social sciences departments. Oh, apartments? No, departments. So it is both an exhibition, ex exposition of research, and academic account if you want a proof. It was approved by the Vienna Research Council, and my institution got some points, credits. And uh, what I wanted to share also in that book, I came up with three different conceptions that artistic research can be used in the context of scientific research as a methodological alternative. It can also be used as, as a method in the art studies. And you employ different various methods and you try somehow to produce new knowledge. Also, you can use it in the context of contemporary art practice, and you don't need the academy at all. You do it in your field, and the artist is a researcher. Yeah, so basically we did a lot of, let's say, artistic research saloons. Salons, salons. So saloons meeting up with uh, local artists and researchers and philosophers, and we came up with this definition back in 2014. That, that artistic research is a groping process, that intuitively and consistently follows the inconsistent traces of an artist, embodies experiences and employs original and unique methods to create emotional knowing or acquire knowledge as a byproduct. And presentation of its results is just as important or even more important than the research process. And it's also epistemological engine for developing the conception of research itself and the human cognition. Yes, but I am now into other questions. So I forgot this book already, and uh, a couple of years ago I pu published another one trying to question, is writing still a condition of research? Because, you know, in a lot of research protocols you have to write to communicate the knowledge you have acquired, discovered, justified. Otherwise it's not ex accepted. Uh, but, you know, if you go to any 
let's say, defense of of physics and mathematics, you might see that uh, the scientist writes only one formula and then presents a, a brochure of 20 pages, and this is a PhD thesis. So in mathematics, it's not so important to write. Maybe in arts, it's the same. I don't know. You, do, you write a, your own method. You write about your own method and discoveries in a very small brochure, and you make an exhibition instead of a formula. Yeah, so I was trying to, to think about it, and this came out in this Atlas of Diagrammatic Imagination, which I have it in front of me, and um, uh, it's quite a long book. It's, if you un open it, and uh, it's not easy to open it without a big table, you see it's like nine meters long. So I did it together with my partner, Lina, and you see it's, it's very big. You can measure. And uh, I'll circulate it uh, around for a moment. <clears throat> but actually, the main question, we actually invited a lot of artists and we tried to, we asked them to, uh, to, draw, your, to draw their hypothesis or to draw their main research statement. So in the, in the center of the book, which is bundled by this uh, gum, you can open it up and see. So there is an art, this made the articles which are more visual than textual, and we, every, every, each of them is uh, representing an, an argument. Yeah, so we were asking a lot of questions, how diagram is differing from a text, and what is pros and cons, and uh, uh, yeah, there is a lot of stuff going on, but let's move further. We have some more interesting questions in the end. So this is me trying to read that book. It's not, not an easy activity. You need to immerse in it with your full body. And um, this is the only way you can see it, and it's very difficult to make it digital. Yeah, so we call it visual writing, and uh, this, these diagrams they somehow try, helps us to avoid or to propose alternatives in, uh, for logocentric communication and, and make it more visual. So this was one of the projects I was curating in the Fayan Pavilion in Venice Biennale, and this was Artist Conceived Museum. And basically, the main idea was that the artist was uh, Daniel Lischkiewicz, and he made a museum of his own works and some design artifacts from the period of the 60s and 70s and 80s in Lithuania. And he was trying to contest art history of Lithuania and trying to prove by his artistic moves that there was uh, uh, that some, some artistic movements were existing which were not discovered yet by the art historians. So basic, yeah, basically there was no abstract art in Lithuania because, because it was forbidden, let's say, by, by censorship. But he tried to find some proofs in, in, some, uh, in a work by some activists that, for example, uh, one, one partisan who was lying here shot in his bunker so he was trying to say that his uh, uh, activities, like guerrilla gu activities, were kind of artistic practice. And uh, then he also employed some other interesting cases from Lithuanian history and put it into display. You see a lot of strange and curious things from old times and from new times. This is a, it's an artist, Danius Lischkiewicz, posing in front of a pavilion. Yeah, for example, this was an interesting case in 1987, on the important day of, for Lithuanian independence. This guy, Bronius Magis, he went to Leningrad, St. Petersburg, to, to Hermitage Museum, and he, he destroyed the Rembrandt's Danaya with a sulfuric acid and knife. Like, he cut it and put some, uh, some sulfuric acid, and uh, it took almost 20 years to re restore this painting. Uh, but uh, the artist claimed that this guy was doing not uh, political activism, but he was doing artistic intervention. Yeah, it was quite interesting uh, conclusions he made. So I wanted to finalize this with a 6G of artistic research in the academy. So, you know, 6G, no, 5G is uh, now the uh, internet of like mobile connection, which some of you have already, but also with a 5G, 
you have a lot of uh, conspiracy theories around. If you install 5G, it changes your life, it changes your mental position, it changes everything. You cannot live. Birds are dying. Also, planes are crashing because 5G is running all around. So maybe artistic research is 5G in the academy, and it, it's a little bit shamanistic practice. And uh, based on this, I, I made this small table. So first G, one G is a, is a normal artist, it's a normal like traditional PhD in humanities, which was done by artists since the 80s or even earlier. So in that case, you do a PhD in philosophy or art history, and your practice is not evaluated and included at all. So f you know that G stands for generation. 2G, the connection is getting faster, and it's more like you can already start loading some images on your computer, on your phone, if you have 2G. Yes? Yeah, maybe. But it's very slow. Like. So you can include some images in your thesis. But still, you have to write a lot because text, it's only text which is possible to transmit on 2G uh, devices. So devices academy, you can imagine. And uh, so mostly it's text-based. And um, artists are defending a traditional thesis, but uh, somehow the practice is a little bit discussed in it. The 3G, you know, it's, it was very common like five years ago, four, maybe 10 years ago, it was everywhere. So you can already have some images and videos, very slow videos. So this is like a uh, like 50-50 thesis that you produce your artwork, it's included into your final defense, and you also uh, have a written thesis. But the problem is that you have to produce two theses. One is artwork, exhibition, project, another is a written like textual argumentation. But this is now the most common, and we have also the same in our academy in Vilnius for already for 10 years. So artists try always to play around because the requirement is to write 30,000 words, which is like a half of a traditional thesis in humanities. So we try to play, we, we, it doesn't say, the regulation doesn't say that the words have to be different. Maybe it can be the same word 30,000 times. So we try to find, play it around and we will see what happens. And so the 4G is that practice in the front thesis where artwork is defended together with the reflection in any form. So it means that you, you do uh, your proper artistic project and then you have a very short reflection. Reflection can be a video essay, it can be a dance piece, it can be anything which somehow articulates your practice. This is happening um, yeah, in, Finland, in Finland for sure, in some countries maybe as well. So 5G is kind of uh, utopia but it also it's reality. It's the artwork defended as a PhD thesis, and it means that your visual or audio or whatever uh, elements, they speak for themselves in their language, and they prove that there is epistemic dimension in the, in the work. So practice as research in its full speed, as I say. But this is always the problem of a comedy. If you, if you in the comedy have people who can read, who can see knowledge in your work without reading a paper, then you have a wonderful and brilliant committee, and it understands what you wanted to convey through your artwork. So this one, I, I know it, it's happening in a few schools in Australia. I'm now trying to find the proper documentation of any defense which can prove, but people told me, so I have to find it myself. And 6G, I don't know, it might happen somewhere. I, I've, I've read already that in Finland they are testing 6G devices. But it will come in 2030, but I'm not sure what does it mean for artistic research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Utata, for asking a lot of questions, or proposing a lot of questions about uh, research. I guess that's somehow in the nature of doing research on research when uh, there's a lot to think about. Um, I was uh, in the perspective of our workshop yesterday. I just want to try to contextualize your um, your talk and today's topics, as also with what we worked with yesterday, uh, epistemes of knowledge, 
uh, we worked with um, in a practice-based uh, workshop on diagramming. And now today we start with uh, Marisol's uh, not only statement, um, where she talks about this onto epistemic or onto to logical openings as ways to to be in the present situations that can open up for new investigations of events, uh, historical knowledge, and uh, and we heard uh, Jane Jinkaisen translate this into a very uh, physical or practical way by transgressing both borders, historical events, and also uh, discursive forms of of knowledge, you could say. And I was thinking, you didn't talk so much about diagramming here uh, in the in the presentation today, but maybe you could say a few words of the p the potentials of thinking language with diagrams, because I think there was something in that context context of finding other way to communicate ourselves or um, think knowledge in a, as Christopher said earlier, in a less linear way. I think it's, it has a lot of potential and as I said yesterday that I hope in 20, 30 years we can uh, defend our artworks as thesis without any words and it's kind of a futuristic proposal but maybe it will come in, in life. What, what, I, what I see, the potential I see in the diagram is because it has both uh, tacit knowledge, which is uh, like, uh, in this case, sometimes it's visual, sometimes it's audio, depends if the diagram is sonic or is it visual. And you know, a tacit knowledge is very difficult to verbalize, to make it, uh, let's say, conceptual, to make it into statement, into textual statements. But you can, I'm happy that diagrams can make uh, visual statements. And it's still, it's, it's a, something in between. You have some words and concepts, but you also have some other domain, which is closer to some artist, artist practice. I don't see that, I don't say that a diagram is a remedy for everybody, but uh, it might help uh, somehow to uh, communicate with different epistemic communities. I mean, I think the diagram can also convince uh, uh, some epistemic communities which don't believe that artists, art produces knowledge or artists produce knowledge. So it can be something in between that you can say, look, there is some words, but also there is some uh, other dimension which is not transferable in, in words. And uh, yes, I think tacit knowledge is, and embodied knowledge, because a lot of diagrams is also produced by your bodily activity, especially in the dance and choreography. Uh, you can dance and you can leave traces as, as, as a diagram of your performance. And then you can read it as a piece of... Uh, also, you can understand it as some kind of also epistem. So working with diagrams, working with transgressing knowledge, that a potential in artistic research, could it, since you're talking about the future, could it um, change... Or what could it change if you look like 30 years in the future? What is the potential here? It's a big question. Yeah, it's a big question. <laughs> but, but, but the potential. But you can take. But potential, I mean, I, mean as, I don't know, it's very also. Yeah, you know, uh, culture and science is very in inertial, so it's kind of very slow and the protocols are changing very slowly. So if you think about, uh, let's say, doctor of philosophy, it took uh, hundreds of years for some disciplines to, to, to get acknowledged. So I think it's, it's happening very fast in the arts. In, in less than 30 years, we have it already in, uh, in academies that are artistic practice is acknowledged as practice which produces knowledge and changes epistems. So I think this is very much fast forward. 
And uh, when you always think that in the 15th, 16th century, the same person could be also recognized both as an artist and also as a scientist. Because they were doing experiments in both fields. And only from the 17th, 18th century, these two activities were separated into different fields. So now we are just coming back to, and trying to say that human activities uh, are non-disciplinary or post-disciplinary. And I mean, wherever you have an intention to, to somehow seek some, for something new, new insights, experiences, or knowledge, so you can justify it and you can be, you can, I mean, be accepted into this epistemic community in any field. You were talking about um, this 5G as being uh, defending an artwork as a PhD. Uh, and it's probably along the lines as what Christina is asking, what's the potential of that compared to how uh, artworks were defended pre PhD. I mean, has it changed that we have uh, PhD'd the art world, <laughs> so to speak? Has it changed uh, when we imagine us coming to 5G? Has it changed the way we talk about artworks to defend it as a uh, as a PhD? Does it make sense? I'm trying to understand your question, but I mean. Uh, Artwork is uh, always is staying as an artwork, but if you just put different glasses, you can see some epistemic value in it. If you, and if you bring it from from the art gallery to academy or to a research council, it still has the same properties. But de depending on what what kind of glasses you put on, you see different things. Is it like a pink glasses, or is it the gray glasses, or is it the whatever like infrared glasses? You already like try to research something in what is inside. And I, what I forgot to say that uh, this is not uh, like linear history of uh, 5G. I mean, all of, uh, all, all of Gs can exist at the same time parallelly. But it depends, I mean, of a school and of uh, like how liberal is any school or academy or university which allows 5G. I mean, all of academies are allowing one first G. But not everybody is allowing uh, to, to choose to make it happen to to defend an artwork as a thesis without any uh, uh, like explanation or justification. It as is this artwork is a piece of knowledge as well, not only piece of art. Thank you for yesterday's workshop and today's talk. Um, I would like to ask. Uh, Perhaps starting from the point that you are the head of doctoral school in Vilnius Art Academy, I wanted to ask, maybe you could share your insights and concerns in uh, relation to um, the quality of the research projects that are conducted in the doctoral um, in the doctoral studies in art and uh, I've, I've been hearing a lot in your uh, talk these propositions of uh, allowing just uh, sort of standing for artwork um, talking for itself. Uh, and uh, yeah, like in the art community, I feel like we are talking quite a lot about this um, issue of uh, people Studying PhD studies without having the proper tools to conduct uh, academic uh, research and then being put into the frame of an academic research. So maybe you could talk a little bit about, I don't yeah, know. Actually, I hear three questions in your question. Okay. But uh, <laughs> yes, it's uh, one is always like uh, you have a scale. On one side you have good art projects, on the other side you have good research projects. And uh, any, you can somehow, if evalu evaluators can put it on the scale from left to right. So some of the projects are better art projects, some of them are better research projects. So it's very difficult to, to have a project which is both good as art piece and piece of art and piece of research. So this is a problem of evaluation and um, also, problem maybe of some kind of 
recognition and acknowledgement. Because, you know, if there's another important question about art market, and we don't have time to touch it, but art market doesn't need anybody who has the doctor of arts. I mean, sometimes it's, we just want to kick them out. It's, it's, it's overqualification, and it doesn't help to produce. I mean, doctor of arts doesn't help to produce your better artwork. I've, I, I want to somehow keep this going on. I mean, it's not needed to, to make better art or to make art faster or whatever. It's just different different type of activity that you can somehow develop your skills do, to do research. And uh, I always trying to say that contemporary world is so difficult and complex that scientific methods cannot understand it. And we need artists, we also need shamans and other type of practices who, which could help to understand the complexity of our contemporary world. So this is one thing. Another thing is uh, I'm very fresh head of a doctoral program, like two years, and we have some projects which we have been running already for four years or five years, so I inherited some, let's say, people, and since we have a program already for 10 years, so there's also a lot of, um, I mean, also changes. I can al already see that we had at least five changes in, in this, uh, I mean, sorry, at least two changes every five years in the program, radical changes. But uh, we don't ask, uh, I mean, now I'm trying to change the program, but we don't ask people to do academic research. This was from before, because most of the professors were having a background of art history, and the only understanding what, how to do research is to do academic research. Now we are trying to get rid of this request to do academic research, and we ask artists to communicate their results in writing. And it could be essay. It could be any other type of writing, which somehow has the power to convince the committee or peers or communities that their practice has also in research potential. So, yeah, it's true. I mean, this is always coming into the curriculum that artists studying doctoral, in doctoral programs, they say, you never taught us how to write, and now you ask us to write a big book. But uh, I'm trying to say that we don't ask them to write academically. And we always say, of course, if you don't have skill, I mean, PhD program is not to learn new skills. I think you already have to come with your skills and your practice. So some artists are good in writing, for example. Some artists are good uh, in talking. Some artists are good in something else. So, I mean, it's a uh, PhD program is not for everybody, unfortunately, sorry. Yeah, hello. Um, I would like to know if you have some more empirical data on money in your country and so far as it would be interesting to have some numbers somehow to understand what is actually the investment of a country like yours into uh, the financialization of PhD in the arts and what is the numbers that goes in, let's say, PhD 